There I go. So now we're recording, and I'm sit down for the rest of this talk because you don't really need to be looking at me and everything that's important is going to be on the screen. And so we'll just, oh, this is going to operate a little bit slower now that I'm recording my screen. So we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. Yes, yeah, I'm starting to slow down a little bit. Okay, cool. So I'll sit down. And so the, the takeaway from this is hopefully that you're just going to get some ideas for ways that you can spend some more time with your tools. We'll start with a little bit of pre-guidance. If you're still at a point when while you're still learning how to learn and you still haven't quite figured out how to pick up new technologies and languages, then I would encourage you to continue doing that. Continue spending time figuring out how you learn and how you learn new languages and technologies. The stuff I'll be showing and talking about is after you've done that, after you've become accomplished and accustomed to learning new stuff. If you can't type without looking at the keys or you have to constantly look down to see what keys you're on, my advice to you would be that that would probably be the best bang for the buck uh, in terms of not being able to look at the keys. And that, so maybe you don't have to look at any of the, the letters, but you still have to glance up for the symbols or, or do you know exactly how to reach for that closing curly brace and without looking and the number keys and those. If you don't, then spend some effort and some awareness on learning those because every time you have to look down and look back up, you're losing context. And it might not feel like you're slowing down, but but you are. And so I would say that that would be some, some pre some pre guidance. And if you have all those things and you've been doing this a while and you know how to learn and you're pretty proficient with not having to look at the keyboard, well then I would encourage you to look for ways in your workflow that you're doing some repetition. And that may be work, repetition in process. It may be repetition in actions that you're doing in the code editor, but you're looking for repetition, things that you shouldn't have to think about. So why is this important? I think it's important because as developers, our brains are our number one tool, right? It's, the, it's our number one tool that is going to help us get better. And it should, it should be our bottleneck. Our brains should be our bottleneck. It should be the slowest thing. It shouldn't be our fingers. Our brain should be the slowest thing in our, in our workflow. And so anything that's repetitious, anything that's moving a window, finding an application, launching an application, adding a new function, and doing the things that you do all the time should be almost muscle memory or require very little cognitive load so that you can just do it, almost think it and do it, and you're not even thinking about it. To do that, we're going to have to be very intentional about our inputs. And what I mean by that is our keyboards and our mouse. I'm not suggesting a particular way. Some people, and I've seen, especially in, if you're using Visual Studio a lot, an almost real, a way that a lot of people do it will have one hand on the mouse and one hand on, almost like a gamer does, right? Where you're moving around and you're doing different movement keys, but you've got one hand on the mouse and one hand on the keyboard. And that can, that can be really productive if that's what you're trying to optimize for. I don't do that. Matter of fact, I've turned my touchpad off and I don't have a mouse up here. So I'll be doing everything from just my keyboard. And I found that that makes me the fastest and I can get my muscle memory and everything else in place if I don't ever have to take my hands off the keyboard. So that's what my system is optimized for keeping my hands on the home row keys. And so that's what, that's just me. And if that works for you, then cool. But that's the other thing that I've noticed in the way that people use their computer is many of us will leave a lot of tabs open in our browser. I've watched Kev. I don't I haven't seen Kev tonight, but Kev has a ton of browser tabs open. Now, for some people, it's, that's just way too much cognitive effort, but I think he's also installed some browser extensions that help him find the tab he's looking for and get to it quickly. And if that's your way your mind works and you want to have a bunch of stuff open, then that's what you should optimize for and make work for you. You'll notice that in the terminal, I tend to have quite a lot of things open. And so that's just the way my mind works. I almost leave them as little to-dos, if you will. And so that tends to work for me. So I've tried to optimize around it. So it's around your inputs, how you use your mouse and keyboard for what's going to work best for you. And do you like to leave stuff open or close stuff? And you should optimize for those. So I'll set up, I'll show you my setup and some of the things that I have in place uh, as an example. And maybe you'll get some ideas or maybe you'll find some inspiration. So I'm running Arch Linux. And, uh, and the laptop decal. Uh, I'm actually a big fan. I'm such a fanboy. Now, to give you some context, I, was at, I worked for Microsoft for 12 years, so I used Windows for a long time. Uh, I also used Mac for about six or seven years, was my daily driver, was a Mac. 
and I've been I've had Linux as my daily driver for about two years now and I'm absolutely sold I love it and I can go on and on and on about it this talk is actually just an excuse for me to show off my tools really is really all it is and I, there's a little bit of a voyeur thing and being able to watch someone else use their system I think it's kind of always fun to watch someone see how someone else works so I use Linux I use i3 as my window manager it's a tiling window manager, we'll get into that. I use Tmux as a terminal multiplexer, we'll get into that. I also, use, I don't use Bash as my shell, I use Zush, and so we can talk a little bit about that and the plugin Omazush. And I use Vim, NeoVim specifically as my text editor, and I use it straight from the terminal, which is a different way of, uh, it's a way of using it. Some people use a graphical Vim editor, so I use Vim. We're only gonna, I'm, we're not even really going to talk too much about Vim because it's just way too big of a topic. So I created a meetup group this week. Uh, if you have seen that yet, I literally created a whole meetup group just for Vim. It's called Vim AKL. There's a link in the thing. And we're just going to spend every, uh, once a month, I think is what I set it up, every something, yeah. So we'll just spend once a month just diving into Vim. And I think I, if you have ideas for talks, then that's cool. But I honestly have enough content that I could do every talk on Vim and uh, We'll be fine. And then, uh, and then I also use browser extensions. And so there's some browser extensions I use to make me really productive in, in the browser, and we'll get to those too. So let's kick it off. So I do use Arch Linux. I've used lots of different distros. I've, well, a lot of them. I've been using Linux since the 90s from Slackware. It was probably the first distro I used, and I've used a whole bunch since then. And I really like Arch for a number of reasons. One, the package manager. Actually, there's not much difference in all the different distros, but the package manager is really easy to use in Arch, and it has a bunch of different repos or package repositories from official, extra, community, and multi-lib, and this Yawert tool, I don't have a mouse, I can't point to it, but that Yawert tool is, is a tool that actually searches across all of them, and so it makes using Pacman, which is the package manager, uh, which has a cool name too, eh? Um, uh, makes it real easy and the documentation is probably I've heard that Fedora has pretty amazing documentation but to think that it's better than Arch is I don't know I've already contributed to it and I've not been able to not find an answer in the Arch wiki uh, which is uh, which is here on the left so yeah so Arch I don't have really anything in terms of the way I, I yeah, I really don't, haven't done anything to configure it too much. Obviously, I have a bunch of different packages I've installed for a dev environment and things, but there's nothing really to show in terms of a demo. So let's move on to i3. So i3 is a tiling window manager, and you'll, if you notice, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a demo just to show you how I move around in the operating system, but i3 is my UI, effectively. There's a couple of tiling window managers I think Dominic uses awesome, if you still use it. Um, but there's an, it's another tiling window manager, and it basically there aren't you. It does have floating windows, but you never use them. Everything is always either maximized or in a pane, and it just makes moving around way faster. I don't have a desktop manager. I don't have a start button. I don't have any kind of a status bar per se. I do have I do have this. If you look down at the very bottom right, I have there is a status bar. Uh, and on the left, you can see what window, bottom left, you can see what window I'm currently on. I'm on 9. And on the right-hand side, I can see what Wi-Fi I'm connected to, what my IP address is, when I am connected, how much hard space I have left, how much battery I have left, uh, what, what percent CPU I'm on, what's the temperature of my CPU, and what's the date and time. So there is a bit of a status bar, but that's actually a plug-in to i3. So it's not part of i3, it's a separate thing called the i3 status, and that's the bottom. I also do have an application launcher. If I hit Alt-D, you'll see at the top that I, have an, I can type VLC, and you'll see that I'm, I do have an application launcher, but it's super minimal. And that's also a plugin. I, it's, I had to tack on to i3, it doesn't come with i3. And I also have a lock screen, which I've mapped to Alt-Shift-X which locks the screen, and then to get back in, I just type my password, right? And so that's also an add-on. So I, it's not part of i3. I had to add that on and put it in the script and all that stuff. So it's, it takes that Linux uh, approach where a bunch of small tools that do a very small thing but do it really well, and you just kind of compose what you need from the different tools, and it works really well. I don't have a desktop manager which keeps things running much, much lightweight, the, normally the window manager runs inside of the desktop manager, 
but I can get by that by using uh, the Xinit RC, which launches i3 directly without any kind of a desktop manager. So in terms of the UI for the operating system, it's actually much smaller than something like Ubuntu out of the box and, and other ones. It also has really good documentation. It's got a really nice API for configuring it. Um, I could pop over here, and if I can remember where, I think I put them in configs. I'm gonna have to bump that up, and then the I, my i3 config is here. So it has a pretty easy to read. Um, I can set my font for i3, and it's got a bunch of, it's all scripted. So I can set up all kinds of things for moving around Windows. And so I can, so I'm in my terminal now, but if I hit Alt and any of the numbers in the bottom left, I can move around. So I usually put, I, and I, I always put my terminal on one, and it, it's just my, you'll see there's a lot of OCD evidence in this talk. Um, so my number two is always Chrome, not Chromium, but Chrome, and I have a number of different, I have uh, a number of different sites that I'm, that I'm logged into. So there's four different tabs across the top. And I'm just navigating through those with Alt, and I'm using the, the Vim movement keys, so H, J, K, and L, to move around. And I'm, that's pretty consistent on my whole system. So all my movement keys are Vim keys, Vim movement keys, and it's just super, keeps it super consistent. <clears throat> There's also this. If I want to show them in, a, in, in that kind of a view, I can do my windows that way. And that was just Alt-E. Alt I can hit Alt-W to go back to that. And there's also an Alt S for stacked. And now you can see that the tabs are effectively stacked at the top. I don't use that. I use, I use the, the tab kind of approach. But, but all my windows are that way. So if I go to three, that's Slack. I always put Slack on three. And I put my personal stuff on four. And this right now only has, it only has Firefox, but sometimes there'll be a Chromium window as well. Five, I put all my school and work stuff. Currently, that's only just a Firefox as well. And then six is patchwork, and that's, that's on six, full screen. And then I think I had some things on, yeah, a couple of other browsers on nine, which we can get to a little bit later. So yeah, so I can get to any of these, and I can also easily move windows to other numbers. I can rename numbers. I can pretty much, and it's just all hotkeys. It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So that's i3, and I can, if I wanted to create a new one, uh, for example, if I'm in this window and I just hit Alt-D, I can type VLC and it'll bring up VLC in another window. Or I could go to a new window. Actually, if I go to, s yeah, so if I want to move that to 8, I can just move that to 8 and then go to 8 and there it is. So it's, the moving things around and, and working with things is really easy. Alt-Shift-Q to quit it and then go back to 10 where the Prezo is. Right, so it's moving around is really quick. I'm not ever trying to find a window. I'm not ever resizing a window. That's for the birds. That's just a waste of time, right? So I'm not going to be resizing windows and looking for windows and trying to place this window here and drag it and maximize it. No, 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 no. And shockingly, this is really easy to use. When I first picked up i3, I thought, whoa, all these hotkeys and stuff. But they follow a really consistent metaphor. So it's not too difficult to learn, and you can actually pick it up really easy. So that's i3. Also use tmux. tmux is kind of like i3 for your terminal. This is where things start to get a bit, <laughs> well, you'll see. Um, so this is my terminal, and I have a lot of different terminals going on at the same time. First, I have tmux provides sessions. So I can, I hit a button, and I can see all my sessions. I have six sessions. And I can use my Vim keys to go up and down through. And I can also see the windows inside of those sessions if I use the right key. So I can pop up and I can see all the different windows that are, that are in each of these sessions. So each of these sessions is a separate session. I have mine set up to automatically uh, save my whole config. Because you're like, holy cow, you have all these six sessions of terminals open with different windows. And those windows have panes. So I have a lot of different things going on. I have mine set up to save automatically, so if I have to reboot, I can boot my terminal back up, hit a hotkey, and it'll restore all of the sessions and all the windows and all of the panes exactly how it was before I rebooted. So that makes it pretty sweet. And so I can literally just pop straight into, if I were to go to this one, then it takes me straight to that session and that window in that session. And so that's just, uh, yeah. And if I just choose the, 
if I just choose the, the main one, then it just takes me to whichever was the last window I was on in that session. So yeah, and so this is two different panes. So I have obviously Vim open on the left, and I have the, uh, just another terminal open on the right. And I can move with a hotkey using my Vim movement keys. I can move back and forth between, because that tends to be something I do often. Cool. All right. So that's, that's I3. Lots of, well, actually, that's, that's uh, Tmux. And Tmux just gives me the ability to have a lot of different terminals open for different things. I have them named. You'll see the name in the bottom left, configs. And if I move to a different one, then I can see it's changing in the left. Oh, I should, I should mention. So if I go back to configs, I have two windows open here. I have zero and one down at the bottom. I'm using Powerline is a, is a fairly popular UI tool. It's written in Python, and it just gives you a really nice, uh, a really nice uh, UI to tell you where you are. So I'm in configs, and I have two windows, Zush and Zush, and I can rename these to whatever I want them to be, and they'll keep their name. And so it's just real quick to move between the windows as well. And of course, I was moving between the panes here. So these are two different panes. So sessions, windows, and panes. And you can pretty much create any kind of setup that you need to for your terminal. Nice. I do use Zush. I use Oh My Zush. And I'm not going to go too much into this, but Zush is an amazing shell that actually has a whole lot of features that you don't get in Bash. Uh, some of those are, well, if you're using Oh My Zush, you get themes. I don't know if you noticed my, I don't know if you noticed my, my, term, my, my prompt, but it's got the little yin-yang and the path and what branch I'm in and whether that branch has changes. And, and then it gives me my, my terminal on the new line. There's a whole bunch of these, and I know that any shell can do this, but I picked basically one that was close to what I wanted and then went in and edited it, created the little, the little yin-yang and and saved it as my own. So it just makes it everything really exactly like you want it. All of the colors in PowerShell match the colors that I've created in i3. So I've obviously I've spent some uh, spent a bit of time with this, just making everything really consistent and, and nice. Cool. Uh, yeah, so look into, uh, it was funny, I was talking to Ro the other day about about Zush, and he was like, yeah, that Zush uh, syntax, syntax highlighting, how could I live without it? And I was like, hmm, I think I've been living without it. And I went and looked, and I found it, and sure enough, if you type C, ah, it's green, so C does something, it just clears the screen, it's an alias I have set up. And if you hit CA, oh, no, nah, that's not a real thing, but C-A-T, that is a real thing, right? So you actually get syntax highlighting of whether it's a real command or not, which is a really cool thing. I've created a whole bunch of aliases, uh, I probably should show you some of those. So the Zush profile, Zush environment, there's, these are just a whole bunch of functions I've written, and you can run these functions right from the command line. They're actually really easy to run. So if I do gh, then I can type in my GitHub password, and it'll set up my, it, it'll set up my SSH key for GitHub, but then I've got a whole bunch of them over here for GitLab and DigitalOcean and SSB and other uh, virtual environments that, I've, that I have online. And I have just all kinds of things to turn my touchpad on and off, to do key mappings, to do Windows stuff. I've got three monitors at home. I can run one command and it sets all my monitors up the way I want. I can go to work, run another command, and boom, they're just, it, just, it just works. Every, I've scripted just about everything I want. My dot files do require a lot of refactoring, so I haven't done that refactoring, but I'll get to it. Um, but the dot files, uh, if you aren't familiar with Mac and Linux dot files, you, keeping all of your dot files in one place and, and pushing them to a GitHub repo is a really good thing to do. I keep mine updated all the time. So if I have to rebuild my machine, I literally clone my dot files and run a script and it creates all the symbolic links for all my, all my dot files to work. And it just, it works really well. And I just, I'm always keeping them updated. And so, and there's all kinds of things here for, yeah, most uh, brightness, launching Steam, recording my screen, post-processing of my stream. Yeah, so just all, any scripts that I need. And then these are, all my, these are some of my aliases. So Oh My Zush creates a whole bunch of aliases for you depending on what plugins you use. And I've just gone and created a whole bunch of other ones for all kinds of things. So if I want to see, for example, a tree, 
I can say TRE and see a tree of the current. Now I've got my font bumped up, but so I can't see it all. But I like, I, I'm also really big into clearing the screen before I run stuff. So if I type CL, I can see CL or CLS or CT, it does the tree, but clears the screen first. So if I, for example, if I, if I did this, then you'd be able to see it, CT uh, or CLS or CT, CL. So it clears the screen first and it's just really nice, I think. Um, so yeah, so there's a whole bunch of aliases that do that. And if you don't, uh, I, thought, I thought this was a pretty cool, that's pretty nice. You can either type which or type and it'll tell you what the alias is. And if you, it also works with a, a, a function. So if you've written a function that you can run from the command line, you can do which or type on it and it'll show you the function. If you forget something or, or uh, I can say type uh, tp off and that's, is a shell function, but if I type which tp off, then it shows me the actual function. So that's quite nice. And I do use alias and grep what I'm looking for because I'll forget certain GitHub aliases and I'll have to grep them to find them, but it's all good. So yeah, so a lot of editing in shell scripts and <coughs> aliases. I use those quite a lot to just make things faster. Also acts as a really good documentation. Like if you figure something out, like a shell script, and you're like, oh, that's freaking cool. Even if you might not ever need it again, you can create a, a function for it, and then it's kind of documented that, and they're like, how did I do that again? Oh, that's right, it's in my, it's in my Zush RC file or something. So, so Zush and OhMyZush make a really good team for the command and just creating aliases and things. I could probably do most of what I do with Bash, but it's, it's, it's shiny. Vim. And NeoVim is the latest version of Vim, or is a branch of Vim. Uh, Vim is often said to have a benevolent dictator for life, Bram Molinar, and, and he's quite um, diligent about the commits uh, on, on the Vim repo. And so some people that wanted some changes and wanted to improve the code quality, build up more of a developer ecosystem and community around it with more and more pull requests. And so they created NeoVim. Uh, most of this stuff is, is, is consistent with Vim, but the things with the asterisks, the last three items are specific to NeoVim. So you don't need a mouse. It's kind of intended to not need a mouse. It's super lightweight and fast. It also follows that model. If you look at my, if you look at my, my VimRC, I use quite a few plugins, but I do have to pride myself in that all the plugins that I use, I actually use. So there, <laughs> to be honest, I've had Fugitive installed for a long time. That gives you the Git integration into Vim, so you can do uh, patching and merging and all the same stuff that you can do with the command line. You can do it in Vim, and I've had it installed for a long time and not really tapped into its use, and I've just recently started using uh, Fugitive, which is Git inside of Vim and doing all the Git stuff like staging, committing, uh, cherry picking, patching, and all that other stuff. You can do it right from inside Vim. So, um, but I actually do use all of my, my, my Vim config file. So I go through it regularly and go, ah, oh, I'm not ever really using that. It's gone. And so I do keep it pruned, and most of the most of my environment, I just manage it and keep it pruned. So it's uh, it's highly scriptable. There are just tons of plugins. I can do most of the things in Vim that you can do in Atom or or VS Code, moving lines up and down, and of course, yeah, just all kinds of things. A lot of uh, the Git integration and everything else. So if it's you just take what you need from the plugins. Uh, there's a lot of it, yeah, so, and the plugins are async in NeoVim, which is, which makes it quite a bit faster. Oh, and this is a really cool feature too. So if you, if I'm over here, let's go to a different screen. If I'm here and I go, and, and I'm in Vim, I can do term, and I get a terminal inside of Vim. So I know that you can do this, there's plugins for Atom and other things, VS Code has this by default. <laughs> this is taking a while, but I have the actual terminal, not just a terminal, but my terminal, the terminal that I've set up with Zush and oh my Zush in Vim. So that makes it quite, that makes it quite powerful. Nice. Okay, and then the last one is Vim in the browser. So the other challenge is that you want to be able to use all this, or I want to be able to use all this no mouse stuff in the browser as well. And so if we pop over to a browser, I have two uh, browser extensions. I can't point to them, but I have two browser extensions <laughs> in, the, in the top. I can't even get up because I'm mic'd up. Um, but there, you saw the, you saw the, 
the, on the left we have um, Firefox. And so if I wanted to say, for example, let me, what would I, what I normally do? I can go up and down. I can follow a link. Link following is pretty sweet. I just hit F and it highlights all the links. So if you already have your eye on the link that you want to go to, like the installation guide, which is in, I can just hit in and off I go. So all you have to do is see where you want to go, hit F, and then whatever lights up on that link, hit it. It's either going to be one or two keys and off you go. So there's no reaching over for the mouse, finding your cursor. Of course I'm not on it, but I can go, I can go back with just, oh, that, that wasn't back. I can go back with, with that. It's not, oh, okay, cool. Um, but I don't have to reach for the mouse, find the cursor, hi highlight, make sure I'm accurate, click it, and all that, right? And so it's just, oh, and you did see that I can, I can go between tabs, I can create a new tab, and yeah. So yeah, don't really need a mouse. And also, something I haven't been using as much lately is I can hit V, one sec, uh, yeah, I'll, I can hit V and it'll ask me, okay, where do you want to go? V is visual mode in Vim, and if I say uh, FF, it puts my cursor there. Now I can hit W, or actually I can hit V and hit W, and now I'm actually highlighting text. So if I hit Y, it'll copy it, and then I can paste it. Right? So even text selection in Vim, no mouse needed, which is, uh, that's pretty cool too. Right? If you're, and of course you can highlight multiple lines and all that business. Right? So and if, on the right I have Chromium, and I can do all the same stuff with Chromium over here. So if I hit B, oh, it's actually a caret in this one. The, the two extensions are not, they're mostly compatible, 85, 90% compatible. Most of the stuff is the same in the two. I don't know if you use more than one browser, but I tend to use Firefox as my main browser, and then when I need, when I'm doing development and development tools, I use Chromium. But uh, yeah, so, but they're mostly compatible. So all the stuff that you can do in one is mostly what you can do in the other, and, uh, and that's Vim in the browser. So in closing, I would say, look, how do you, how do you, I obviously did not get here in a day or a week or even a year. I, every time I find myself doing something repetitive or something that is just mundane or tedious, I think, how can I do this faster? And that might be in Vim, it might be somewhere else, but how can I do this quicker? And I'll just do a quick search. And if I can find it, I'll implement it, save it, stage it, commit it, push it to my dot files, and then move on. And then it's just a matter of remembering that it's there and trying to use it often. It's like trying to remember people's names. The easiest way you can remember people's names is that when you get introduced to them, is say their name and keep saying their name. Oh, that was really cool. Def, you know, da da da, and just keep using it. And the more you use it, it'll just get ingrained, right? I'm sorry, you had a question in the back, and I forgot about you. What's up? I think it does a pretty good job, to be honest. I don't know if we're going to find one of those. I don't know if we're going to find one of those in here, because these are just going to be normal hyperlinks. But I think it does a pretty good job of looking for on-click uh, event handlers and, and, and highlighting them. There are some sites that are like stubborn, and of course, there's wacky things you can do on a web page that would make it not work well. But if I think if you're following most of the accessibility guidelines, the, the extensions work pretty well. I've not. There's only, I would say maybe, mm, this works probably 95% of the time. It's in the high 90s. But I usually don't get stuck too. I don't usually have to reach for the mouse very often. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just about trying to identify it. It's really about having the awareness that you're doing something that's taking a while and, uh, and, and just trying to fix it. And the last thing is review periodically. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I teach, and, and I teach a lot of people that haven't necessarily been coding for a very long time, so I've gained a tremendous amount of patience with people uh, in using their, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, no, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. But, um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> pairing with someone, oh, that's the disadvantage, clearly, is that when we're pairing, oh, we don't use Don's computer. <laughs> No, no, that doesn't happen. Although I do have Atom installed, and I actually have VS Code installed, so we can fire those up. I'd have to turn off Vim mode, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, it's just about reviewing your dot .files regularly, looking for opportunities, and just, you know, making it your own. This is really opinionated, right? And it should be. It's your machine, and it's your tools, and you want to be the best, you know, you want to be the fastest, and you won't, don't want to have to think about the stuff you don't want to think of. So hopefully you found a few things that, that you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I do this a lot. Snippets are really good. I don't use them that much, but I, I could. I do use Emmet, if you're familiar with Emmet, for writing HTML, so I do use that occasionally. Um, so yeah, but it's about finding what you do all the time and just making it super fast. If you're using Atom or VS Code, learn all the hotkeys and just get really good at them. Also, don't don't highlight and select text. Don't ever do don't ever do that. That's bad. Double click and you'll highlight the word. Triple click will highlight the line and then go from there. But don't select. That's just silly, right? So um, yeah, but it's those kinds of things. Look, try to raise your awareness about what you're doing, and uh, yeah, and do that. So here's some resources. I did create a Vim uh, meetup just because I'm like, holy cow, if I was going to talk about Vim, we'll be here all night. So uh, if you're if you are using Vim or if you're curious, I don't recommend Vim for people that are still learning stuff. That's the, the cognitive load. This is what happens. You're, this is your productivity, and this is when you start learning Vim. And then after time, you'll end up increasing your, 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 yeah, your performance and stuff way better. But it does take time. It takes months. And you have to be very diligent. It has, it's like learning to type all over again in many ways. So uh, make sure that you have the cognitive space to tackle that when you're, when you're ready. And Vim, if, you, if Vim isn't your thing, try Emacs. Try, try other editors, right? It's, Vim's not for everyone. Um, yeah, my setup guide, my dot files. The setup guides, it's mostly accurate. Um, but it's missing some stuff, uh, and then yeah, and this is hosted on, uh, yeah, it's tools talk tools dash talk dot now dot sh. So maybe I, well, I'll put it in the meetup. Um, but that's it. That's all I have. Hopefully you found something.